Welcome and thank you for coming to view this presentation on the Trilateral Commission and Technocracy. My name is Patrick Wood. I am the founder and editor of the August Forecast and Review. My site can be found at www.augustforecast.com. Just for your reference, I am an economist by education, a financial analyst and writer by profession, and an American constitutionalist by choice. With no apologies, I maintain and support a biblical worldview. A little bit of history about myself. I started to write about the Trilateral Commission back in 1978. With the um, able help of Professor Anthony Sutton, we published a newsletter called the Trilateral Observer. We published two books called Trilaterals Over Washington, Volumes 1 and 2. And since then, the Trilateral Commission has uh, matured and grown. And now we're looking back over a 35-year period to see exactly what the Trilateral Commission has accomplished or not accomplished in this interim period. I think you'll find this presentation fascinating. And without any further ado, we will get right into it. I want to start by explaining that in 1979, Senator Barry Goldwater, Republican from Arizona, published a book called With No Apologies. In that book, he stated the following, quote, the Trilateral Commission is international and is intended to be the vehicle for multinational consolidation of the commercial and banking interests by seizing control of the political government of the United States. The Trilateral Commission represents a skillful, coordinated effort to seize control and consolidate the four centers of power, political, monetary, intellectual, and ecclesiastical. Before Senator Goldwater published this book, in fact, in 1978, my office was approached by his uh, then chief of staff to confirm the information that we had uh, found on the Trilateral Commission. And he confirmed to us that this was the same information, uh, the same view that he had developed from a completely different perspective, I might add, being inside of the political system in Washington, D.C., that he had come to the same conclusions that we had, that the Trilateral Commission indeed was a coordinated effort to seize control and consolidate the four centers of power. So the question is, how did it all start, the early days of the Trilateral Commission? Well, the Trilateral Commission was co-founded in 1973 by David Rockefeller and Zbigniew Brzezinski. They had floated the idea at the 1972 Bilderberg meeting that was held in Europe. They were encouraged by that group to create the Trilateral Commission for the purposes of being an action group to create a new international economic order. And then they had picked, handpicked uh, 289 initial members in uh, 1973 to actually start the Trilateral Commission. This group of people was picked from North America that is Canada and the United States in particular. There were no uh, Mexican members at that time. Uh, members were chosen from Europe and Japan as well, approximately one third from each geographic region. This was truly an international group to be an international action organization. From the United States, there were approximately 97 members out of 289. They were chosen from the ranks of Democrats and Republicans, conservatives and liberals, supposedly. And the makeup of the group uh, consisted of bankers, industrialists, academics, like Brzezinski, for instance, politicians. And then there was a group of, um, a smaller group of members that were uh, comprised of media, law firms, and NGOs, that is, non governmental organizations. In 1976, three years had transpired since the founding of the Trilateral Commission. The executive office, in my opinion, was hijacked by this organization that we know as the Trilateral Commission. Jimmy Carter and his running mate, Vice President, uh, well, soon to be Vice President, Walter Mondale, were both members of the Trilateral Commission. They had been picked and chosen by Brzezinski to run for president. And Brzezinski later confirmed this himself, that he was the, the man that identified Carter as presidential material. 
And upon Carter's election to the presidency, then Brzezinski was immediately appointed to be the national security advisor. And as we'll find out later, the national security advisor is one of the most important positions, underrated positions, I might add, too, in Washington, D.C., as far as the president's concerned. And then lastly, Carter appointed almost one third of the Trilateral Commission members to top cabinet and administration posts, all but one of his cabinet actually in the end before his term was done were members of the trilateral commission so with the election of jimmy carter and walter mondale uh, and the uh, saturation of trilateral commission members in the administration there was virtually no other viewpoint brought to the presidency and brought to the to the executive branch other than that of the trilateral commission this indeed was a hijacking and they've continued this domination ever since as we'll see it's fair then to examine what was the original trilateral policy. Well, there was three essential elements to it. Number one, they wrote continuously in the early days that they wanted to foster a new international economic order. This was the exact term that they used in their literature. Every uh, paper they wrote, published, every uh, task force report that they put out had this specific language in it that their goal was to foster a new international economic order and obviously that meant something that was different that was uh, than, than existed at the time secondly they sought to promote interdependence amongst nations there was no systemic call for interdependence at that point in history but the trilateral commission set upon themselves to create this policy of interdependence and they assumed it to be true and therefore, uh, their literature reflected this, that because of the interdependence that they were assuming was there, that they would create a new international economic order around this system of interdependence. And thirdly, they promoted, they sought to promote free trade by dismantling tariffs and trade barriers around the world, and especially in these three industrialized regions of the world. Between Japan, North America, and Europe, the bulk of trade in the world was generated from these three areas. So it made sense from their point of view to tackle these three areas initially, to dismantle the system of tariffs and trade barriers so that trade could flow back and forth easily and quickly without financial consequences. The book that set the course for this was Brzezinski's book, between Two Ages, subtitled America's Role in the Technotronic Era. Zbigniew Brzezinski produced this book uh, in 1970. It was um, not necessarily a bestseller in those days, but it was a brilliant book that was noticed by the likes of David Rockefeller. This is, I believe, the primary reason that Rockefeller and Brzezinski teamed up is that Rockefeller saw the promises of Brzezinski's book and he wanted to jump on board with it. So if we look at Brzezinski's philosophy of the world, we see that he proposed or noted at least four stages of societal development. And it's important just to get an overview of this. You can find Brzezinski's book, by the way, on the internet. If you search for it, I believe there's a scanned copy out there somewhere that, uh, that you can probably download. If you choose to buy a book on eBay or Amazon.com, you'll find that they're very expensive because they're out of print, and Brzezinski is somewhat of a internationally known figure today, so his used books are very expensive on the Internet. The first stage of societal development that Brzezinski described was religious. This was the period before, for instance, 1850 to 1875, where the world is basically regulated by uh, religious organizations and by biblical uh, dogma. And uh, Brzezinski referred to the religious community as narrow-minded uh, and full of massive ignorance. And you can see that Brzezinski had a very dim view of religion and the Bible in general. Uh, but nevertheless, this was the, the first stage that Brzezinski wrote about in his book. And secondly, he wrote about the period of nationalism, where the nation state was 
um, um, nation states of the world had a certain uh, equality before the law. And this period of nationalism reigned for uh, quite some time up until at least the middle mid 1900s. And of course, the system of nationalism began to break apart after two world wars. There was a lot of concern amongst the global elite that the nationalistic system was failing. The third system, the first stage that Brzezinski noted was Marxism. And about Marxism, he said, quote, it represents a further vital and creative stage in the maturing of man's universal vision. Now, I want to point out that Brzezinski was not a Marxist, nor was he a communist. The fact that he makes this flattering statement, if you will, about Marxism is only really an observation on his point that this is a necessary step that we must pass through in order to get to the fourth and final stage, which he defined as the technotronic era. That is, rational humanism on a global scale. He called it the result of American communist evolutionary trans transformations. And that, of course, was a direct quote from his book, Between Two Ages. So Brzezinski saw the world progressing through these various stages on towards the technotronic era. And as we examine Brzezinski's book then, we need to see what did he mean by technotronic? What was his idea? What was his vision, if you will, of the future of a technotronic era? So we look at a few different concepts from Brzezinski's book. <clears throat> we see that he wrote uh, the nation state as a fundamental unit of man's organized life has ceased to be the principal creative force. International banks and multinational corporations are acting and planning in terms that are far in advance of the political concepts of the nation state. So you can see that Brzezinski has a very dim view of the, uh, the concept of the nation state, if you will. And he believed that the international banks and multinational corporations were light years ahead of the nation state in uh, creating an organized life, if you will, for the future, the principal creative force of the future. He goes on then to explain the technotronic era. And this is critical to understand this. A few uh, key words are, are highlighted in yellow. And he said, and I quote, the technotronic era involves the gradual appearance of a more controlled society. Such a society would be dominated by an elite, unrestrained by traditional values. Soon it will be possible to assert almost continuous surveillance over every citizen and maintain up-to-date complete files containing even the most personal information about the citizen. These files will be subject to instant retrieval by the authorities. Now, I'll make the connection later between Brzezinski's technotronic era and the total surveillance society that we find ourselves in today with uh, the American public as well as um, uh, basically all the rest of the people in the world as well being surveilled by our intelligence organizations like the NSA, the CIA, the um, Department of Homeland Security, and so on. Brzezinski went on then to say, the old, quote, the old framework of international politics with their spheres of influence, military alliances between nation states, the fiction of sovereignty, doctrinal conflicts arising from 19th century crises is no longer compatible with reality. Now, Brzezinski had a vision of reality, and this is what we're going to discuss as we go along. And you can see that he had also a very dim view of national sovereignty. I might add he had a very dim view of personal and private sovereignty as well. Uh, but we're going to look at this now and find out what, uh, what their vision uh, for the future was and how they sought to achieve it. So Brzezinski's um, analysis of world and world affairs is very astute. I don't like it necessarily, but it's very astute, and he was well regarded at the time by members of the global elite. Richard Gardner, in 1974, was a member a member of the Trilateral Commission. He was one of the very first members, and that uh, first 289 people that were handpicked 
to uh, uh, populate the Trilateral Commission, he was an academic. And he wrote a paper for the Council on Foreign Relations um, called The Hard Road to World Order. And in this paper, Gardner made uh, an incredible statement, and, he, and, I, and I quote, in short, the house of world order would have to be built from the bottom up rather than from the top down. It will look like a great booming, buzzing confusion, to use William James' famous description of reality. But an end run around national sovereignty, eroding it piece by piece, will accomplish much more than the old-fashioned frontal assault. Now, those of you who are uh, history buffs uh, of the period from, for instance, World War II up to about 1965, 1970, will remember that there were several outrageous attempts to introduce globalism and the New World Order into the United States. They were rejected by Congress, uh, solidly rejected, and the American people were very clearly not ready for a New World Order or to be a part of a New World Order. And they resisted the plans and the frontal approaches of the global elite to the point where the global elite basically believed that they were just beating their heads against a brick wall. And Richard Gardner very clearly states this was a case. And what was really necessary was an end run around national sovereignty, not a head on approach, but an end run around national sovereignty, eroding it piece by piece. And of course, that implies over a period of time. And he prophesied, in a sense, that that would accomplish much more than the old-fashioned frontal assault. The question is, how did the Trilateral Commission use the executive branch to achieve their objectives? That is, an end run around national sovereignty, uh, creating a system of interdependence, creating a new international economic order, and so on. Well, let's consider the position of U.S. Trade Representative. The USTR is the uh, executive within the administration who is responsible for negotiating trade uh, agreements, treaties, and so on uh, between uh, international bodies. And this, uh, this person is the administration's lead negotiator, if you will. You can see that over a period of time from 1977, starting with Robert Strauss, to 19, excuse me, 2013 uh, to present, Michael Froman, that there have been 12 appointees to the USTR position. Nine of those, nine of those have been members of the Trilateral Commission. So you see Robert Strauss, you see Reuben Askew, William Brock, Carla Hills. Carla Hills, by the way, was the principal architect of the North American Free Trade Agreement that was negotiated by George H.W. Bush and signed into law by Bill Clinton, also a trial, both of them Trilateral Commission members as well. Mickey Cantor, Charlene Barshevsky, Robert Zellick, uh, Susan Schwab from 2006 to nine, and now Michael Froman appointed in 2013 and continues in that position today. He is the principal negotiator then. Uh, for instance, of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which is underway right now. Does that mean that Clayton Uter, Rob Portman, and Ron Kirk were somehow unfriendly to the policies of the Trilateral Commission? Well, no, not at all. Uh, these people were not members. However, they, uh, they were completely in line with the policies of the Trilateral Commission, and several of them had very close ties with members of the Trilateral Commission. So, uh, virtually... The, uh, this, this position of USTR was dominated completely by the members of the Trilateral Commission, and it would be ridiculous to think that they did not bring their own particular uh, views and policies to the table when they were negotiating these treaties and agreements over a period of years. The World Bank is perhaps the most important banking institution in the world because uh, they have been responsible for uh, guiding and uh, creating policy in countries all over the world. Uh, the way this works is they offer loans to countries in return for what are called conditionalities. And uh, in other words, if you, if you, Mr. Country, do this, this, and this, then we will loan you X hundreds of millions of dollars 
to do certain projects, maybe infrastructure projects or, uh, you know, whatever, societal development projects. And as it turned out, when World Bank released money, that uh, other industrial multinational members of the Trilateral Commission were very, very close at hand to gobble up the money, to vacuum it up in a sense. And so we see that the president has uh, of the United States has been the one who appoints the uh, presidents of World Banks. Six out of eight of the World Bank presidents since 1968 have been members of the Trilateral Commission. Robert McNamara, starting in 1968, reigned all the way up through 1981, is a very long run. A.W. Clausen, 81 to 86, was formerly chairman of the Bank of America. Uh, Barbara Conable had a relatively short term. James Wolfeson reigned for 10 years. Paul Wolfowitz had a short term from 2005 to 7. Robert Zellick had five years from 2007 to 2012. And so we see that the World Bank has been dominated by members of the Trilateral Commission as well. Well, let's look at the executive office itself. Here we have, uh, starting with James Earl Carter in 1977 and Walter Mondale, that was the first initial, if you will, hijacking of the executive branch of the United States government. When Ronald Reagan was elected uh, in 81, George H.W. Bush, his vice presidential candidate, was a member of the Trilateral Commission. And of course, then Bush uh, was president himself from 89 to 93. His vice presidential uh, running mate uh, and vice president then, Dan Quayle, was not a member. Uh, Bill Clinton and Al Gore swept the 90s. Both of them were members of the Trilateral Commission and had a profile very similar, actually, to uh, Jimmy Carter in 1977. Uh, Clinton was a governor of a state. Um, he was uh, easily swayed by members of the Trilateral Commission, and he was trained and groomed by them to be president of the United States. When George W. Bush became president in 2001, he was not a member, even though, remember, his father was. But Dick Cheney, the vice presidential candidate, was a member of the Trilateral Commission. Uh, interestingly, Dick Cheney's wife, in her own right, was also a member of the Trilateral Commission. So. Uh, you had two from the same family. In the Obama-Biden administration, uh, neither of those were members of the Trilateral Commission. However, as we'll see, they have had very, very significant influence from the Trilateral Commission. Basically, they've been surrounded and uh, uh, penned in, if you will, by members of the Trilateral Commission. So now we look at an important office of the National Security Advisor. I mentioned briefly before that Zbigniew Brzezinski was appointed uh, to be the, the first um, trilateral, uh, if you will, uh, National Security Advisor to a complete trilateral administration. That's Jimmy Carter and Walter Mondale. But if we go back to 1969, we find that Henry Kissinger was the first NSA who was an, uh, an original member of the Trilateral Commission as well. And uh, he served until 1975, so he picked up the first two years of the Trilateral Commission being in operation. Brent Scowcroft uh, picked up from 75 to 77 for a couple years. Then Brzezinski came into the scene from 77 to 81. Uh, thereafter, we had a few other people, Richard Allen, William Clark, uh, Robert McFarlane, uh, Admiral John Poindexter, who were not members, then Frank Carlucci, a member of the commission came in 1986. You see Brent uh, Scowcroft again from 89 to 93, took a second turn. Anthony Lake, 93 to 97. Condoleezza Rice, 2001 to 2005. General James Jones, now this is into, of course, the Obama administration. General James Do Jones, Tom Donilon, and Susan Rice, who is currently the national security advisor to the president. Now, the reason that the NSA position is so important is that nothing gets to the president's ears, at least as far as security is concerned, except that it comes through the hands and the fingers of the National Security Advisor. This is the gatekeeper of information that comes to the president relating to intelligence matters anywhere in the world, and especially in the United States as well. So we can see that the Trilateral Commission had great interest in the NSA position because that's the person that was the right-hand person to the president. 
People always ask, and I should just inter, inter, interject this here, how does the Council on Foreign Relations fit in? Are they the ones in control of things? Uh, is the CFR really the, the all-powerful uh, global organization? And the answer I'll say to that basically is, is not really. We find that Richard Haas, for instance, uh, currently the CFR president, has been for some time, is a member of the Trilateral Commission and a very prominent member, I might add, of the Trilateral Commission in the United States. 44% of CFR board members are trilaterals. Uh, considering that the CFR has about 3,500 members in North America, uh, it would be, uh, just on a numerical basis, it would be reasonable to expect maybe 2% of the board might be members of the Trilateral Commission, but we see an overwhelming 44% of board members being trilaterals. So they have a, 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 an undue influence, if you will, in the CFR. And lastly, the, 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 all the proof I think that we probably need is that the most important CFR task force papers that have been produced in the last 35 years are often found to be chaired by members of the Trilateral Commission. In other words, even though there may be other operatives writing uh, pieces or contributing pieces to task force, we find that those members are, are uh, chaired, if you will, or supervised by members of the Trilateral Commission themselves. So the CFR is really an organ or an operative of the Trilateral Commission, not the other way around. So it's fair to ask then, what is the new international economic order? This was their phrase that they used from day one, and we're still concerned with it today. The reason this phrase interested me, by the way, way back when, is that my background in economics caused me to be curious about an economic order because I was trying to understand the economic order as existed back in the early 1970s, trying to uh, piece it together and, and get a you know get an understanding. This is this is my career, my chosen career back then. And when the Trilateral Commission started talking about this new international economic order, I said, well, that's that's interesting. What what what's this? And I started to look at it. And so now, as we as kind of looking back over this period of time, we can fall back on Brzezinski's book and say, well, okay, what is it? Well, it is the technotronic era. This was the the visionary period of time in the future that Brzezinski called for, and we'll examine it, we're going to examine it more as we go along. But it is a controlled society dominated and managed by an elite. Congress would be made irrelevant, and if it were possible, would be disbanded because uh, the technocrats or the technocratic uh, managers, if you will, hold a very dim view of politicians that uh, pretend to know what they're talking about with technology and yet make, you know, the wrong decisions routinely, mismanage situations, and uh, to the great harm, economic harm of the multinational corporations in many cases. So uh, they would gladly uh, do away if they could somehow uh, with the political process that uh, often impedes them. And then the global banks and multinational corporations are really the primary actors and planners of economic life in this new international economic order. And if you're not picking this up already, this is taken directly from Brzezinski's book, the concepts and ideas in his book. Continuous surveillance over every citizen is an important part of the new international economic order. This is the total surveillance society. And this is part and parcel of the technotronic era. And lastly, we must have files containing all personal information for instant retrieval. The new international economic order is not exactly what we expected in the 1970s. And I'm going to relate to you now a little bit more that's been discovered since then that helps to make sense, that helps to make sense of all of this. And that is the concept of technocracy. I'm introducing a new term and a kind of a new concept here, but it's really important to see what technocracy is as well and how it fits in to Brzezinski's technotronic era. Technocracy with a small t is defined by Webster's Dictionary as government by technicians. 
Uh, also, management of society by technical experts. Now, this is easy to understand, and we see in, in many cases how this is true today around the world, not just in the United States, but in Europe as well, and in Japan. Technocracy with a capital T, however, is an altogether uh, different thing. It is, in fact, a replacement economic system based on energy distribution and consumption run by engineers, scientists, and technicians. And you can see how this blends with technocracy with a small t, management of society by technical experts. But the key to technocracy as a, a formal subject is that it was a replacement economic system intended to replace capitalism. And this is a, a very interesting historical topic that we need to understand. Technocracy Incorporated was actually an organization that existed in the early 1930s that had great notoriety for a number of years before it kind of faded into the background. But Technocracy Incorporated originated at Columbia University in 1932. They actually were originally housed at Columbia University. Their offices were there and their study groups were there. The association with Columbia didn't last too long, but it lasted long enough for it to gather great notoriety across the country. This organization was founded by uh, M. King Hubbard and Howard Scott. Uh, as we'll see, M. King Hubbard was an important player later on in the oil industry. Howard Scott pretty much faded into uh, the woodwork over a period of time, was not an influential uh, person after Technocracy Inc. failed. But they created the Technocracy Study Course, which was there to be considered their Bible, if you will, on the economic system of technocracy that they proposed. And we should note that Hubbard himself, M. King Hubbard, was the person who created, he was a, uh, by the way, was a, a very brilliant geophysicist who had a specialty in, in oil, uh, hydrocarbons. Uh, Hubert created the peak oil theory in 1954. And as a result, he became hailed as one of the fathers of the eco movement in almost any eco-movement, uh, eco ecological movement that you look at today, you'll find some reference to, who, to, to, to uh, the peak oil theory. And this was the man that created Technocracy, Inc. back in 1932 to 33, And he, again, uh, surfaced to do something very significant in 1954. And we see a common thread with, uh, with Hubbard all these years. Now, here's an actual picture of a technocracy event that took place in Southern California. Uh, some people might recognize this as the Hollywood Bowl. I don't know how many people the Hollywood Bowl held back in those days. It was a relatively new, uh, new construction at that point. But you can see that the audience, uh, the attendance there is uh, quite full. There are not very many empty seats. And my guess would be that there were many thousands of people in attendance of this particular meeting of Technocracy, Inc. And of course, down on the stage, you can see the American flag up in the upper right-hand side, and you can see the Technocracy logo right below it. It's the, the monad symbol. Some know that as the yin-yang symbol that means balance. That they, that's why they chose that as their logo was balance. And then here's another picture of the uh, leader of Technocracy, Howard Scott an imposing figure at six foot five. And there's a close up on the right side of the Hollywood Bowl stage. And you can see uh, standing up in the very front is Howard Scott. And standing behind him are the various members of uh, the leadership and important people from uh, the organization. You'll also notice that they're all wearing what appear to be gray suits. Uh, the women are wearing matching gray suits, if you will, to the men. They have um, dark blue ties and they wear the logo pin, which is the monad symbol. 
and it's curious that uh, they all had this this more or less formal uniform. Uh, the reason, just as a side note, why this came about was that the director of operations of Technocracy Inc., a man by the name of William Knight, was an aeronautical engineer who worked for an aircraft company that was a subsidiary of the German aircraft industry. And he was uh, very familiar with uh, the rise of national so socialism at the time in Germany. And he felt it would be good if Technocracy Inc. had a paramilitary look to it. So he adopted some of the dress standards from uh, Nazi Germany and convinced the leadership of Technocracy Inc. that it would be good for them as well. Uh, this was no, no joke either. They, it, they were so serious about it that they actually convinced General Motors to create a paint, a color of paint called Technocracy Gray that could be ordered on GM cars. So if you were a real serious technocrat and you wanted to really toe the party line, why you could wear your gray suit and drive in a gray technocracy gray matching car as well. The highlights of technocracy, and this is just uh, an overview of my study of technocracy in the past few years here. By nature, it produces volumes of inviolable regulations that are science-based. When I say science-based, I would not refer necessarily just to empirical science, but also to other areas of science that, that people in that field will call science, but it really is not empirical science at all. It's more or less value statements that are arrived at uh, because of their studies. Technocracy creates totalitarian control in the end, but it is not socialism or communism. Yes, there are similarities. But the similarities are not fundamental, and one needs to understand what technocracy is to see the differences between socialism, communism, and technocracy. Technocracy seeks to replace price-based economic systems with energy-based systems through a use of energy credits that would be used to pay for goods and services based on the amount of energy that was used to produce those goods and services. But this is the essence, really, of the techn technocracy economic system, that the price-based system would be replaced completely by an energy-based system. The requirements for technocracy were written in 1932 very clearly by Technocracy, Inc. They appeared in their book, The Technocracy Study Course, that also, by the way, is available on the internet. You can search for it and find it and read it for yourself. I'm going to list the first five out of seven requirements that were written back in 1932. And you'll get the feeling as I read these that the technology was not available to do the things that they wanted to do back in 1932. I believe this is one of the reasons that the movement failed, is because people recognized that even if they thought it was desirable, that they didn't have the wherewithal to do it. The first requirement was register, and this direct quote, register on a continuous 24 hour per day basis, the total net conversion of energy. Number two, by means of the registration of energy converted and consumed, make possible a balanced load. Number three, provide a continuous inventory of all production and consumption. Number four, provide a specific registration of the type, kind, etc. of all goods and services where produced and where used. You'll see, by the way, as we go through these, that there is a distinct economic flavor to this, where we're talking about energy, which of course is an input to production. We're talking about uh, goods and services, which are economic issues, where produced and where used, and so on. Number, f number five, quote, provide specific registration of the consumption of each individual. That's an economic issue. Plus, a record and description of the individual. Now, these were the five core requirements 
that would be needed by technocracy to make it a success, if you will, in the conversion from capitalism to the new technotronic era that Brzezinski uh, wrote about in his book. So, what are some current examples of the trilateral slash technotronic or technocracy action plan? And we don't have time in this presentation to go into each one of these individual items, but in my studies of these things in the last several years, um, I'm going to throw these out as examples of the march towards technocracy as sponsored by members of the Trilateral Commission along the way. Number one is smart grid, controlling energy. The smart grid in the United States was kick-started in, in 2009 by Barack Obama using stimulus money to distribute to utility companies around the country to kick-start the installation of smart grid meters in homes and businesses around America. Many of you know already that you probably have a smart meter on the side of your house and you couldn't say no. In some cases, the utility company has visited customers who refused with an armed sheriff deputy insisting that they either allow the installation of smart meter or they will be taken to jail. Now, interesting. Global smart grid is a step beyond smart grid where the global energy network will tie individual countries and continents together to allow for a global management system of all energy used, produced, and consumed in the world. And what's interesting uh, in this endorsement uh, page that came off of a website that's, that is um, uh, very favorable towards a global smart grid, you'll see uh, the picture of Al Gore uh, right in the middle of this. And of course, Al Gore is a member of the Trilateral Commission. He's also Mr. Global Warming. Agenda 21, a plan to change the world. There's many subtleties to Agenda 21. Those of you who have studied will know what I mean by that, but basically it is a plan to change the world. It's being implemented around the world. It came through an organ of the United Nations originally in 1992. It was a primary document that created the concept of sustainable development. But if we go back beyond 1992, back to the early days in the 1970s, we find that the concepts contained in Agenda 21 actually came from a task force report that was written by the Council on Foreign Relations, paid for by the Rockefeller Brothers Fund, and populated and chaired by members of or close to the Trilateral Commission in those early days. Sustainable development, which is a product of Agenda 21 as well, uh, is endemic everywhere in the world today. Um, it's, being, it's been pushed by the uh, industrial crowd, now by the political crowd, the academic crowd, uh, would this exist um, if it uh, wasn't pushed by these people? Possibly not. But the concepts of sustainable development are easily traced back to the early 1930s uh, when they were uh, the, when the same concepts were written about. That term was not used, but the same concepts were written about and developed by early members of Technocracy Incorporated. Global warming. We know by experience, by watching the news, that Al Gore is a principal character in the area of global warming. His book and DVD movie, An Inconvenient Truth, has made the rounds at least several times uh, in the past several years. And Al Gore, of course, is a member of the Trilateral Commission, but it's science-based, not good science in my opinion, but it is science-based and therefore they use this as a good model for technocracy. They use this as an excuse to impose limits and controls on the rest of us as a result. Cap and trade. 
is another area that's uh, maybe a minor area, but it is important. It has uh, failed uh, to gain traction so far, but it is still a big topic all around the world in Europe, in Australia, New Zealand, um, Africa, I mean, India, everywhere. Cap and trade has been um, seeking to limit the production of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, a carbon tax, if you will. This is probably the closest step we have to a full-blown carbon currency or energy credit currency that Technocracy Inc. foresaw in the 1930s. And then we have Obamacare. Um, <clears throat> and even though the Obamacare uh, computer systems are crashing on a routine basis and stories are surfacing of people losing their insurance from commercial uh, insurance companies, uh, I would merely say that Obamacare is not about your health as much as it is about your data. That is, your health care data is being collected through this massive system of registration and induction into uh, what, what will be one day probably a state-run uh, single-payer insurance system. But they need your data in the system in order to survive. And this data, of course, uh, when combined with all the rest of the data being collected on you, um, will provide a very complete and thorough profile on every American citizen. This industry graphic was taken off of a website, actually, of a company or, that is involved in this area. And I, I didn't want to put the name of the company in here because it wasn't important. What is important is that it demonstrates the customer-centric nature of technocracy. The consumer, the customer, is at the middle of this graphic. And the two-way arrows going back and forth here to all these little satellite disks, we can see reading from uh, reading from the from clockwise from the top, we see climate change, health promotion, renewable energy, water footprint, biodiversity, enterprise risk management, sustainable buildings, sustainable constructions, and cradle to cradle. We used to use the term cradle to grave when we talked about government's assistance and, uh, you know, the nanny state, things like that. Now the terminology has changed from cradle to cradle. In other words, your offspring is now included in your profile uh, so that they have a generational continuance, if you will. So again, this system of technocracy and the technotronic era is being driven by economics, not politics. Total control over the economic process depends directly upon total information awareness within that economic system. Now, this is my assessment, by the way, not a quote from somebody else, but the total economic control depends directly upon total information awareness within that economic system. And now I hope you will understand why they need a total surveillance society. This is what's driving the total surveillance society. Uh, you have the office, for instance, of the director of national intelligence now, that is the, the shepherding organization of all these different agencies like the National Security Agency the Department of Homeland Security, the FBI, the Central Intelligence Agency. These are probably the principal four. But the Director of National Intelligence, interestingly enough, has an organizational chart that actually looks like this. There are 16 different agencies that report to the Director of National Intelligence. And these are intelligence gathering organizations that contribute in information back to, and of course, policies are set for those organizations from the top down, from the Director of National Intelligence. The policies are pushed out to these 16 different organizations on how, what, when, where, and why they will collect data 
on American citizens and other people around the globe. So where did the Office of the Director of National Intelligence first come from? Well, it was established by George Bush on April 21st, 2005. This was a result of the inefficiencies of the Patriot Act and several studies that had been released at the time indicating that the intelligence communities of our country were not very well coordinated, that information was not being shared correctly to prevent terrorist attacks. And so the National Intelligence Agency was created by George Bush, remembering, of course, that Dick Cheney was the vice president at the time and was a member of the Trilateral Commission. The first ever director of national intelligence was John Negroponte, a member of the Trilateral Commission. So there's little doubt that the fingerprint of Trilateral Commission members is all over the intelligence community in the United States. These are the people driving the collection of information on Americans and citizens of other countries around the world as well. Obama's intelligence trilaterals that he's had since his inauguration and his first term include Admiral Dennis Blair, a member of the commission who is a director of national intelligence, Susan Rice as national security advisor currently. She was formerly ambassador to the United Nations, of course, Thomas Donilon has played dual roles along the way. He was first Deputy National Security Advisor, and then when the NSA stepped down, he was promoted into the position of National Security Advisor. General James Jones, another trilateral, has also served as an NSA during this period of time in the Obama administration. And so you can see that the domination and the hijacking continues and the people who were most directly in control of the intelligence gathering mechanism, machine, if you will, in our country, are members of the Trilateral Commission. So some conclusions. The Trilateral Commission was about technocracy from the start. This was Brzezinski's technotronic era that he envisioned. And we see the fruit of that era today as we see technocracy marching forward. It truly is a new international economic order based on energy and societal control. This is revolutionary, it's radical, and the signs are all around us that this is exactly what has happened. This has been the target from the beginning, and this is exactly what they have brought about. It, in fact, has been Richard Gardner's end run around national sovereignty. It's been gradual. It's been confusing. It's been very disconcerting to a lot of people who did not understand what's going on. But Richard Gardner hit the nail on the head that this would be a much more effective way to bring the New World Order into, into existence. All the elements of control are already in place, whether it be cities, counties, towns, nations. This policy has been spread throughout Europe, throughout Asia, throughout the North American continent, through Agenda 21, through sustainable development, through technocratic managerism. We see that the societies, the elements of society around the world have been highly conditioned to put these elements of control into place. And then we see that the total surveillance society really is the final element to make all of this work. The little sub elements and stuff like, like the agenda 21s and the smart growths and the, the, uh, you know, the city controls and so on that are, are around the world. These things are important, but what ties it all together in the end is the successful implementation of the total surveillance society. It is the final element. And that means that the Trilateral Commission endgame is close at hand. This has been a long time coming. We didn't understand it back in 1978 when we first started studying this in earnest. We now understand a lot more than we did then. 
And of course, we have 25 to 35 years of history behind us where we can go back and examine the trail to see exactly what's happened, who caused it to happen, what the outcome and the effects have been, etc. If this presentation has been valuable to you and you would like additional information, I would encourage you to order my booklet, Trilateral Takeover, by going to www.augustforecast.com forward slash trilateral hyphen takeover or simply email editor at augustforecast.com to receive instructions on ordering by return email. In addition, I would encourage you to share this information with other people that you know through either email or social media and give them the opportunity as well to discover the realities about trilateralism and technocracy. I thank you for attending this presentation and I hope that your studies in the future will be profitable.